Hey guys, my name is Rob Noir, and today I have a very special video for you. Today I'm doing another game room tour. So I did a video for this last year, it was like my game room tour summer 2017, and that video was actually super well received, which is why I always wanted to do a follow-up video to it, especially since my game room has really grown kind of exponentially since what you might have seen in that video if you saw it. And so I've been wanting to do that for a while, and it's been pretty much a year since I did that video so I figured why not put another one out this summer get it out before the end of August and then it's like basically like a yearly thing like every year I can do a video like this and kind of show you the updates and if you're wondering why I'm wearing these sunglasses right now it's not because I'm a cool cat or I'm trying to look you know suave and awesome for the camera it's because I actually physically remember the last time I filmed a game room tour like this I had my ring light like right in my face to be able to get in and see all the stuff and it literally made me almost go blind like I was seeing spots for a long time so hopefully these here will remedy that and it's I'm not just wearing these because I'm a pretentious douche maybe I am maybe you think I am I don't know maybe I actually am but that's not why I'm wearing this this is because proper eye care matters kids but yeah so I put that video out a year ago and I got a really good response and so I figured I'd just do another one right here for you guys it's probably gonna be quicker than last year's but it's still gonna go in depth and I just kind of wanted to show off what I've got not to like say I'm better than you or better than anybody else who has a game room especially since my game room is probably quite small compared to some of the other videos you might be seeing on YouTube I don't have a lot of space to work with so I try and make the best with what I have but I just thought it would be fun to kind of show where I'm at and hopefully you guys will get a kick out of it and I've always personally enjoyed other people's game room tours because I feel like every time I watch one of those videos I always pick up on a bunch of tips and tricks that I can then apply to my own game room like how they store this how they display this how they do this I always find lots of useful information and hopefully you'll find a little bit of that in this video here today but yeah guys I think that's enough talk enough prelude let's just kind of jump right in and so I was trying to think up like a funny interesting bit on how to kind of like introduce you guys to the game room I came up with a few things but all of them felt like really stupid I mean there's always like the MTV way like yo guys you ready to check out my crib come on come on I'm gonna show you all the deets or there's always the more, you know, like, Zelda-like approach, like the... da na 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 Or, well, actually... da na 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 <laughs> This video's gonna be fun for me. <laughs> but uh, all kidding aside, guys, let's, let's go in and let's have a look. And actually, to make things a little bit easier, I should probably turn on that aforementioned ring light. Jesus Christ, is that thing bright when you're up close, man. Holy crap. So generally speaking, when you guys see one of my videos, you see the game room already, but only from one of two angles. There's the angle for when I do like solo videos, which is right up here, which is not the angle I'm doing now. And there's the angle for when I kind of am just like laid back, giving you guys some info, like my NHD series, or if I have like Phil or another friend and we're filming like a two player Let's Play, that's the angle that you're seeing right now. And this is obviously, this is my nice couch. Um, it's not actually that nice. I bought it from Ikea. The reason was it's actually very compact, spacious, and still comfy. So it fits into a very small size game room like this one. And this game room, I mean, it's really not big. It's basically like the smaller of the two bedrooms in my apartment that I've just converted into a game room slash recording studio. I also have two mics right here and a TV right there. Normally, I'm not holding the mic like this, like I'm some kind of fucking wrestling announcer with the mic down. This is just because it's too much effort to keep moving it back and forth. I've got my boom stand right here, and I might as well actually show you a good picture of the TV. So this is the TV that everything gets played on when I record. It's being shown on this TV. Sometimes I even use it for my editing. It's really good. It's high quality. It's low lag. It's by Toshiba. And it also, it does 1080p. It's not a 4K display. I have two 4K displays in my home. But this one's only 1080p, and I did that because I don't record in 4K. I only record in 1080p anyways. And this one, it was a really good price, a really nice size, and just overall, I would highly recommend this TV. Of course, down here, we have one of the mics, and I'm speaking into the other one, but it's usually over here. And on the TV, on the top and the bottom, you can kind of see two Wii sensor bars. I'll get into that in a bit. There's really only supposed to be one. So the first thing that you gotta start with in a game room tour is the consoles. So obviously, I've got a lot of consoles in here, 
pretty much the vast majority are hooked up at this point. I do have a couple spares, which I'll mention and I'll call out. But first, on the very left over there, you can see a very old, crusty NES front loader. I actually have three NESs in-house, one which is another front loader much like this one, which is kind of, it's not working. I know how to fix it. I just haven't really had a reason to yet, so it's kind of to the side. And then I also have a top loader that's about halfway through the process of being modded for HDMI. My modder is incredibly incredibly unreliable, which is why it's not fully modded yet, but if that ever happens, then it's going to replace this front loader here. And this front loader actually belongs to my friend Phil. Like I said, I have one, but I haven't really needed to because this one is working alright, so we've just been using this one. Directly below that, you can actually see a GameCube, and you might be able to notice it has like the Swiss loaded in with the SD card on the side, and in the back actually there's the Eon HD adapter, which I just recently got, I did a video on, if you haven't seen it, check it out, I'm really proud of that one. And I've been getting a lot of mileage out of that GameCube recently. It's the Indigo one, uh, model DOL001, I believe. It has a digital port on the back. Then attached to the very bottom is the Game Boy Player for playing my Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color games. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with that one. The next to that, you can actually see my N64, and this is the second N64 that I own. I also own an N64 from my childhood, but that one has seen better days. It's had a few issues. It's working at the moment, but I don't super trust it, so it's just kind of shoved away to the side, and you'll see it later in the video. But this is a really awesome N64. It's been modded with a blue LED light on the front, and it also has the Ultra HDMI mod. So whenever I play N64, this thing is my go-to. Below that is my analog Super NT, which you can kind of see here. I'll see if I can kind of frame it up a little bit better. And if you guys are wondering why there's like that green tape on the floor, that's because when I record gaming videos, there are specific places where I put my tripods and to make things easy for myself so I don't have to like plan this shit out and figure it out every time. I just made like a triangle on the floor out of painter's tape that you stick the tripod in and then boom, you know exactly where to put it every time. It's just you adjust the side to side and you're good to go. But that's the analog Super NT below, which is how I play all of my Super Nintendo games. It's a console that's basically an actual Super Nintendo that's been reverse engineered with an FPGA chip. Super happy with this console. I have a lot of fun playing it. And then on the top, again, over here, you can see my Nintendo Switch. The Pro Controller is right next to it. This is the official dock. When I record, I usually record off of the official dock. I have a few other, like, DIY docks that I've put in my other rooms. I've done a video on that way back in the day as well. If you want to watch that, you can click the eye that just appeared. But that's my Nintendo Switch dock. Again, that's hooked up. Below that is a temporary console, which you can see here. It is an original Nintendo Wii. And that is a temporary console because it doesn't belong to me and I also, I don't need an original Wii. This is actually Phil's Wii and I have it because we were playing a game on the virtual console that he has downloaded to this Wii. And this is also the only console that's not like hooked into my setup traditionally. It's just kind of there with like the cables coming out the front and that's because it's not staying there that much longer. It looks kind of ugly, I'm not a big fan of it. It overheats like crazy, like there's just better Wiis out there. The only cool thing about this one is that it does have the ability to play GameCube games because it's a first gen, but with my GameCube over here, I don't need that shit. Then on the side over here, you can kind of see a massive mess of wires behind it, but normally it's just because of the angle we're at, normally you don't really see that, is my Wii U with the Wii U gamepad. There's also a little charging station area there for the gamepad. I don't actually use the Wii U that much anymore. I feel like the Switch has kind of really stolen its thunder and most of the good games are getting ported over to the Switch anyways. But I do have some pretty awesome games on the Wii U and every once in a while I, I will boot it up and play something like Wind Waker HD or something along those lines. So I'm pretty happy to have that one. That one's wired in as well. And then below that is the newest addition to my console family, which is the Retron 77. This is a clone console by Hyperkin that's designed to play Atari 2600 games. And if I'm lucky, the video I did on playing these games, these Atari 2600 games with the Retron 77, if I'm lucky that video is already out. I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be permanently added into my setup or put aside and then just brought in every once in a while like this original Wii down there. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much mileage I'm going to get out of playing Atari 2600 games, but for the moment it is a part of my official setup and it deserves a little, you know, a little bit of a, a cliff note, a little bit of a mention here. And it is the newest console in this entire 
setup. And then when we go up here, what you're looking at right now is an original fat PS3. This is the very original model. It has the four USB ports on the front. And the reason why I got this model is because it will let you play PS1, 2, or 3 games off of the disc on the system. And it actually contains inside of it the actual hardware of a PS2. That's why the PS2 games work. And it's not playing them with emulation. It's actually playing them like it's a PS2. I did swap out the hard drive for a much bigger hard hard drive because the one that came with the standard PS3 is tiny and really not suited for having a lot of games. It's still really great if you want to play PS1, 2, and 3 games in HD on your HDTV and as you can kind of tell by the way I'm talking about it, there will be a video on that at some point in the future. Then over here, this thing with the glowing keyboard, that's my laptop that I use for most like old PC games like I do have a better computer, but this is my only Windows computer really I mean, I am in the process of building a proper PC But for now, it's this laptop right here, and it runs pretty well I don't really have too many problems with it. It's hooked up to this keyboard here and actually if I remove the keyboard you can see underneath it, there's the VCR, and I actually use this VCR to hook up extremely old consoles to be able to play those on my HDTV. And then on the far left side here, you have my final console that's hooked into my main setup, which is my Xbox One. It's not an Xbox One X, it's just an original. I probably will upgrade at some point if I ever upgrade the TV in my game room to a 4K display. But for now, just the original Xbox is fine, works well, it's probably my favorite way to play third-party games on this generation of consoles. I'm pretty happy with that. I mean, I've been playing a hat in time on it recently and that game is killer, so. And then in this corner down here, this is slightly off screen when I record, but this is where all the recording magic actually happens. You can see over here this thing with the blinking lights. That's a soundboard that I run everything through. And that's pretty that's pretty important to have. You need something to be able to process your microphones. This box that I'm focusing on right here, this is my digital audio recorder. It actually records all the audio to an SD card. It can also do the audio out, running it to a computer or whatever you need. It's really useful to have and I like it because it's portable. And so I can bring my setup wherever I want and record audio there without having to bring an entire soundboard and do all this other stuff. I run cables from my soundboard to this box, but I could record directly on this box if I wanted to. It gets powered through a USB cable or through some crazy AA batteries. It needs like eight. And over here, I got just some random stuff. I got like this little display piece there. I've got like, um, it's not a GoPro, but it's similar to a GoPro. It's facing the wall because it's been bad lately. It's been overheating and I'm not happy with it. Well, actually, it works pretty well. I got my external hard drives in the corner there and that's kind of just this little corner off screen that is me running every everything that you actually see in the videos. And so how all these consoles are actually hooked up, you know, my NES, my N64, everything, it's actually very easy. So as you might have been able to tell from the videos that I do, I am really passionate about getting all these old consoles to run in HD. I try and get everything I possibly can to go over an HDMI cable. If I can get that to happen on the console itself, that's amazing. And so all these HDMI cables from my consoles actually plug into one of two splitter boxes that I have over here. And they're low latency, that was the most important thing for me because I hate input lag. And they take in all these inputs and then they put it out over an HDMI cable and then that plugs into my TV. I have one on this side over here for the consoles that I play extremely frequently and I have another one hidden over there by that super bright ring light which I plug into the consoles that I don't use as frequently. And then these just put it out through an HDMI cable that runs to my TV and when I turn on a console it will automatically switch and the switch detection for this thing is actually pretty good. Like it has a pretty good track record all things considered. The only really messy part of my setup is running all my cables to my TV which I do have kind of propped up in the middle of the room to kind of give me space to work and move around. Like I don't want it on a wall. If I had it mounted on a wall, it would have to be a huge TV to be able to record with and then I don't know where I'd put my microphones. Like, it works best to kind of have my TV in the middle of the room like this. And to do that, I have to pass everything through a bunch of cables here. And you see here, I have a cable from the fucking Wii and just a random cable from the Wii going for the sensor bar. That's because, like I said, that's a temporary console. When that's not in there, it's basically just this one thing of cables with an extra plug-in down there to be able to like pass everything to my TV. Even my microphone cables, they're well shielded so it doesn't introduce any background noise. And I have it zip tied up so it looks fairly clean. If I could hide that, I would, but I haven't really found the best way to do that yet. 
And then over here is really the biggest mess of wires. As you can see, this is just a clusterfuck. Right here is the other switch box I was talking about. Then here I have a VGA upscaler if I can get in. Down there I have a regular upscaler that I plug in the really old consoles that aren't HD yet, like my NES or Phil's Wii or any of those things. Those get plugged into that upscaler. I really want to get everything running HDMI and then retire that thing. That's the plan, but it's still in there for now. And then I have this power bar that I have mounted to the wall here. And the reason why this power bar is exposed is because I actually switch this off when I'm not playing any console on that or not using that thing to charge my camera's batteries. I switch it off so it's not constantly consuming power and these are the consoles that rarely get used so it just it makes a lot of sense I suggest if you have consoles that you almost never play put them on their own power bar and turn them off when they're not in use they don't need to be on all the time that's my crazy bright ring light with the Xbox One Kinect mounted on it. I never ever use the Kinect, but if I ever have to, it's right there. And then one of the tricks that I use in my game room that I picked up from watching another game room video, and I think it was Metal Jesus Rocks. I'm pretty sure he had something similar to this going on at some point, and that's who I was like, oh, that's a great idea, is I have these over the, the, the door storage things. They're usually for like shoes or clothes or something, but in them I put in a bunch of controllers. And because I actually have so many controllers for so many different systems, I actually expanded that and the door that opens to my game room also has these things on the back. And I might even expand them and try and stretch them all the way to the ground because I end up having so many damn controllers. As you can see, it's a kind of a mess. I do have to like reorganize this at some point, but the thing that I do is I keep them all separate. Like that's N64, that's GameCube, that's random wires, Super Nintendo, wires, NES, third-party NES. And over there, I have them all divided up by consoles. Well, it keeps them really not necessarily neat and organized, but it keeps it easy to find. And I mean, so other than that, I mean, there's a few little tweaks and things that I have going on. Like, you can see this foam. I actually kind of went overboard with the foam, but it helps with recording. It helps with the sound. It makes it so that there's no echo in this room. I did do a little bit too much. I'm probably going to scale it back at some point. I do really like the aesthetic. And another thing to know if you ever try and buy this foam yourself is that the pieces aren't perfectly square, so it's hard to make your wall perfect. And if it gets hot, like today it's quite a muggy day, and I'm actually sweating quite a bit while I record this with all all the lights and all these consoles and everything else going on um, it likes to fall off the wall like heat will get rid of it pretty easily over here next to god damn that's bright my ring light I also have these blackout curtains which black out not just the light but also sound from outside so those are pretty useful to have but I'm sure the thing most of you are the most interested in is probably my games. And so I don't really show the game wall that much. I mean, you might have seen it at some point in like uh, my modding a Game Boy Advance video where I, that Game Boy Advance right there in the center, I, I took out the screen, I put in an AGS 101 screen to make it backlit. And so I, I've got a decent amount of stuff here. I'm not gonna go through every game one by one. I kind of did that in my last game room tour back when I only had like, I don't know, 90 games, 100 games, but now I actually tried to tally this up last night, and I have somewhere between 380 and 410 games, depending on how you count things, and by that I mean if you count duplicates, I'm somewhere around 410. And it's also worth noting that I don't have every game that I own here, especially my Switch ones. I've lent out more than 15 of my Switch games to my friends who have Switches and who are also somewhat trustworthy. So I do assume I'll get them back in good condition, but I have the vast majority of my game collection here, other than the duplicates. Most of my duplicates I kind of set to the side because I do trade those in for either store credit or other games at gaming stores. So there's a couple duplicates out, but not that many. And so something else that I do that you might have noticed when looking at these shelves either right now or earlier is that I also label some of my games with little stickers, usually red, although there's a couple black ones over here. You might be wondering what the hell's going on with that? Why are there little stickers? And I will preface this by saying that I do not advocate putting more stickers on games. Like prepping for this video, I went through and I removed all of those little stickers from like Blockbuster or price tags or whatever from all of my games that are out here 
to try and make them look as pretty as possible. And that took me hours. Like it was kind of a nightmare. Like thank God for Goo Gone. But the reason why I do these little red stickers and they are, they're very little adhesive so they don't leave any residue and they come off easy. I do this to keep track of games where there's something wrong with them. This is something I just recently started doing because I'm trying to get all of my game collection working, all of my game collection complete or as complete as I want it. And it became hard to kind of remember uh, that game there, that game doesn't work or something like that. So like this here, this copy of Kings of the Beach on NES, this one right here, it's got a red sticker because this game doesn't currently work. Now it can work. I have kind of gotten it to work in just a quick cleaning. If I did a really deep cleaning, I'm sure that this game would work, which is why it's still on my shelf. I just haven't had time. And having that little red dot, whenever I look at my shelves, is a constant reminder of, oh, this game doesn't work or there's something wrong with it. And if you go down onto my PS3 shelf, I have some games here. There's only two, but like Bioshock Infinite, which has a red sticker on it. That's not because it doesn't work. That's because it's actually missing the manual. If I open it up, there's no manual in there. And when it comes to disc-based games, I always want disc and manual. I want like complete in box. Because it doesn't have it, it has a little red sticker. Not because it doesn't work, but just as a reminder to me, whenever I'm at like a retro convention or something, you know, I gotta look for a manual for this thing so I can call it complete in box and rip off that little red sticker. And so looking at my shelves here, you might notice a lot of little red dots. And again, that's not because these games are bad or like they're completely broken, it's just, they need a little bit of work to get into perfect working order. I've used like the red sticker to denote when it's missing a manual. And there's also only on my N64 games pretty much. There's a couple that have horrible labels. They're games I picked up for like two bucks or that just did not survive the test of time from when I was a kid. And that red dot is to remind me that if ever I have the opportunity to pick up a new version of that game with a correct label because it's definitely not something I could ever display. So again, I'm not gonna go through every game I have here because I have like 300 on display here. But I will go through a couple highlights, a few that I'm very proud of, and a couple of like the random things I have kicking around on my shelf. And up until recently, I haven't really been into getting like little knickknacks and doodads for my game room. It's pretty much just been all straight games. But recently, I've noticed that those little weird things that you put in like a corner or something, like that little thing that nobody else has, that little figurine, that whatever, that really adds personality to a game room so I have been starting to do that that's just like the last month or so so there's not a lot of things beside games here but there are a few that I can highlight and above some of my NES games over here you'll see a small collection of that this over here is actually a coin from the 1000 episode of Good Mythical Morning, which I bought because I wanted to celebrate with them. I thought it was really cool. Underneath that, over here, I have some pins. They're OBC pins or Oil Barrel Chan pins. Next to that, I have the Eon HD adapter box, which the box itself is just so pretty, I had to keep it, I had to keep it. And then you can see next to that, there's like a Game Boy shell. It's a black shell for an original Game Boy. Um, I know a guy who actually restores original Game Boys and he had a few of these kicking around and he gave it to me for free and I thought that was cool maybe at some point I'll find a really cool original Game Boy that's really beat up like the shell sucks but the internals are great and I'll probably just swap it into the shell and if not it's just a cool little thing to have down here I also have the infamous DK bongos they used to be a shelf up between my GameCube and my Wii games but I've had to really fill out that library recently for some videos on playing the GameCube in HD and the Wii in HD uh, I'm lucky in that a lot of my switch games are missing but so that's why it's just one shelf right now when I get those games back it will take up more and I'll have to reorganize a little bit but that's why the DK bongos are here next to like some PlayStation and Xbox games. They're gonna have to come out and go somewhere else at some point though. But like any true gamer, I had to have a set of DK bongos. And on this shelf over here, I have some other cool stuff. I have my very tiny amiibo collection. I'm not into collecting figures or figurines or anything. So I pretty much just bought these for bonuses in game or they were like super cheap, like this Ness one, who is my favorite character in Smash Bros. But other than that, I mean, they were pretty much just function over form. So I have a small little like 
place for them over here. And next to that is actually the Game Boy printer, which goes with the Game Boy camera, which you can kind of see down here. Down here at the very bottom of my far left shelf, I have a collection of wires and AC adapters that are all bound with rubber bands. I guess at this point we can kind of work our way up the shelves. Below that I have Atari games. Oh, and it's worth mentioning that my left and right shelves, those are kind of like one unit in that the games will span across from this shelf to the other shelf. It's not like this line and then over here they continue. Like I like symmetry so that's why I did that. Then the next shelf up I have like some CDs and the shelf above that I have some old PC games and some games that are not like traditional in box kind of thing like I have Wii Sports and stuff like that that I wish had an actual Wii case. And I have two shelves of N64 a shelf of Super Nintendo, a shelf of NES. And on the far right shelf, it's pretty much the same thing, except the bottom shelf is devoted to like some random console stuff. Like there's my childhood N64, I have a digital picture frame, some random crap. There's my Atari 2600, here's some more random crap. PS1 games. Um, if you're wondering about the DVD cases, that's because I was an idiot as a kid, and I wanted all my PS1 games to fit into PS2 cases so that everything was uniform. And I threw out the original jewel case, and I recently found another. I'm waiting for it to arrive, but that was just kind of... I was a dumb kid. Up here is some of my recording capture equipment, and then N64 shelf, which this shelf down here will probably get taken over by N64 if ever I get to that point. Super Nintendo, including Super Game Boy. This shelf over here is my random games that I don't actually own the console for. I've got a couple Sega Genesis, that Football 94 I found complete in box, so I thought that was really cool. It cost me like three bucks, so I was like, hell yeah. Pimp My Ride for the PSP was free, so I was like, hell yeah. I've got some Famicom games and a Famicom converter over here, so I could technically play those on an NES, so sort of I do own the console, but I don't own an actual Famicom, and then more NES games. On the subject of really awesome games that I own though, by the way guys, I do have to throw these two into the hat. They're Atari 2600, but they're very, very special. This first one is a Terrence and Philip homebrew game for the Atari 2600. It's really cool, I'm glad I own it. It's a weird game, but it was just really awesome that this thing exists. And then this here, this looks like nothing, but if you notice it says name this game. It is an Atari 2600 cartridge. And I bought this at a convention for a dollar off of a guy who did not know what was on it. He's like, I don't know, this got traded in, we couldn't test it, we don't even know if it works, if you want it, it's a buck. So it's like, okay, sure. The game that's on this is actually one of the most fun games I've ever played on the Atari, and it's very inventive, so... I just wanted to point this out, because this definitely... I don't know the history or the origin of this cartridge. I guess it's like a homebrew kind of thing, but this definitely isn't something that everyone owns. I'm pretty happy with my N64 collection. I own every game that I owned as a kid, so that was a pretty great kind of like, yay moment when I got all those. There's only a few games left for the N64 that I'm looking for. For example, Buck Bumble and like the Mario Parties, but overall, I mean, I'm pretty happy with that. Super Nintendo, I'm always on the lookout for new games, but it's really hard to find any Super Nintendo games around where I am because everybody just buys those things up immediately. For NES, I haven't really gotten into collecting for NES. These are just kind of games that I just kind of got or just kind of have. I'm waiting until I have the HD NES to be able to really, really enjoy it. You might also have noticed these cardboard inserts in some of my shelves that kind of peek through. Like over here, you can see it next to my Super Nintendo games. This was something I just recently started doing because I like to actually be able to pull out my games at any time and play them. And most of these shelves are a little bit too sunken for cartridge games. So I put a little cardboard insert so that the games actually stick out to the end of the shelf. Again, this is just a little trick that I do. Like NES games are fine, but N64 and Super Nintendo and Genesis and all that. And and even the Atari 2600, like they just, they sink in so far into the shelf that's really annoying to pull them out. But with that, they stay where they need to go. Although weirdly shaped cartridges like the Super Game Boy and all that, I mean, they kind of, they don't really work for it. So you might have to get a little bit creative, but overall I think it's a pretty good tip. And then over here, I have what a lot of my friends like to call my Game Boy Shrine. And I have to give a shout out to the YouTube channel, My Life in Gaming, because they gave me the idea for how to actually display these Game Boy games. Because usually people would just kind of shove these in bins and then you can never actually see, hey, what game do you have without pulling them all out. But if you have these acrylic display stands, which are actually made for nail polish, you can put in your Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games and display them 
and C. Now if you have a crap ton of them, if you have a massive collection, this won't work, but at least to display like the ones you like to play a lot or the ones that like look the best or whatever, this is a really easy and cheap option and way to do it. And like I have here, I don't currently own a stand for this Game Boy Advance. It's the uh, really sexy pink one here. That's not actually in the best condition, but it does work. And you can also fit these in. I used to actually hold some Game Boys in there. And as you notice, like everything pretty much has a stand. Like this Game Boy Advance has a stand. These Wiimotes on either side of the shrine have a stand. Both these Game Boys have a stand. This will at some point down in here. I have a Game Boy Color that right now doesn't have a stand, but it will. And I get all these stands from Rose Colored Gaming. I got a tip about that from the Metal Jesus Rocks channel. They're not that expensive, although if you live not in the US, the shipping can be a bit much, but just order a lot so that it's worth it. And then you can get these cool stands that hold like, you know, all your retro gaming apparel and gear and controllers and everything else that you have room for. I especially like displaying my Game Boys. As you can see, my Game Boy Advance over here, like my regular model, it is modded with that AGS 101 screen, which looks great. Actually, did a video tutorial on how to do this that you can check out if you're interested. Personally, I love the mod and I definitely play this more than I play the square clamshell. I love the shoulder buttons. It just feels way more comfortable in my hands and I'd recommend it if that's something you want to do. On this side of the display over here, I have the Game Boy camera. I have Game Boy pinball. I have some really great Zelda games. That's mostly what I've collected so far on like the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color, but this is going to expand at some point. Over here, I have the Skyward Sword Zelda Wii mode and I think that's pretty much the main things up here. And then finally over here we get to like my disc based games and again I'm not gonna go super in depth. Uh, a few things to mention um, over here somewhere I do have Paper Mario. This one right here. This would be one of the first games I ever like bought as a collector that I like actually added to my collection. The other one would have actually been here Dokopon Kingdom on the Wii which is one that I really like. Um, I think it went here. Yeah I have everything alphabetically organized so that's really important to me. Here I have Link's crossbow training, but it's in like an actual Wii case, which I do have the original case inside of this case, and I have some custom cases. Still gotta make one for Wii Sports. I'm actually missing like half my Wii games, like I've lent out the vast majority of them, alongside the Switch games over here. This pretty much is my entire Wii U collection though. I mean, I have a lot downloaded to the Wii U, but in terms of physical games, I don't really have much more than that. I heard that it's a very small collection though, so who knows, maybe I will add more just in the in the hopes of getting a complete collection someday of the Wii U. I'm sure the games are going to be very cheap very soon. Then down here I have my PS2 collection and this along with the Wii is what I've been really collecting for a lot recently because I've been trying to rebuild my entire childhood collection of PS2 games and I'm almost there. I'm only missing like seven games and I will own a copy of every game that I had as a kid on the PS2. I've gotten most of them back and I've gotten of course some other random ones as well but I, I'm almost there like that's been my big thing I got rid of a lot of them as a kid I sold them off traded them in for store credits at like GameStop and replaced a lot of them with like HD remasters on the PS3 which is a shelf down but I, I kind of I do really want the originals and then over here next to the DK bongos I actually have the Fallout 3 soundtrack it's just the soundtrack it's not a game and I got this for free when I did an order from the store pink gorilla I did an online order and I got that for free I thought that was really cool and a really nice touch and I have here the collector's edition of Dragon Age Origins my brother-in-law worked at Bioware at the time that this was released and he got me a free copy it's up here because it's the only PS3 game I own that's not like shorter than the usual DVD case. I do have some Xbox games over here. I've just recently started getting into Xbox and Xbox 360 though. Never had one as a kid, only played it at friends' houses, and I am curious in it, but I don't really know where to start. Down here I have my PS3 collection, which I think this is pretty much every PS3 game I have. I don't think I actually have any lent out at the moment. I do have a list of everything I lend out, by the way, and I only lend out to trustworthy people now. After having waited like six months to get back a Wiimote after I lent it out, I only lend it out to people who I know aren't gonna pull that kind of crap but I don't think I'm missing any here like this is actually what I have the vast majority of these are games that I bought for myself before I was a collector as well there's not many that I've loaded up on since then and most of these are still really fun to play then below that I have a shelf of all my boxes and now this might be controversial and this might be unlike most collectors but I hate collecting complete in box for Nintendo consoles before they were discs like anything before GameCube 
I typically will not go for complete in box and I will go for loose cartridge. And I do have a few here, like for Super Nintendo I have like Tetris Attack, I have Family Feud, and I have some N64 boxes that are all from my youth. But I intentionally stick away and it's because these boxes, they get damaged so easily and they cost more than the game itself usually, especially with the manual. And all of these do have the manuals by the way. So I try and stick away because I just feel like I'd rather spend that money on an actual game and not have something that like a literal drop of water or a drop of sweat because I'm sweating right now because it's really hot in here could destroy and then like you've lost like a hundred plus bucks like I try and avoid complete in box for cartridge games maybe that'll change in the future but for now it's that's just kind of how it is and on the shelf below that I just kind of have a random assortment of junk at some point this is probably going to get shoved in a closet when I run out of shelf space for all my other stuff but for now it can just kind of take up space there I've got like an Xbox I've got a some third party and 64 controllers I've got like some random stuff the Retron 77 box it's just kind of down there for now eventually I will move that out to a closet though when I need the shelf space for more games and so that's my game room, or at least the bulk of it. Everything I could really think of to show. I'm sure there's still plenty more. I'm sure there's still plenty of stuff that I forgot. I don't know why I'm still wearing these glasses, but that's that's my game room. Uh, again, I hope you maybe found some tricks and tips in this for your own game room. I had originally intended for this video to be pretty short, but as I started going through everything, I realized it's probably still a pretty long video. But I hope you got some enjoyment out of it. I hope you enjoyed seeing the vast majority of my collection. Action. Again, I'm still a small collector. I've only been like seriously collecting for maybe a year and a half at most. And before that, I mean, there really wasn't much. Like my first game room tour video, if you watch that one, I really didn't have that much going on. It was a pretty tiny setup. And now I've got like enough that I'm happy with it. And I have almost completed most of the collections that I want. Like I have almost all the PS2 games I want. I have almost all the N64. I'm pretty happy with NES and Super Super Nintendo at this point. I'm pretty happy with most of the collections. I really, I want more PS1, I want more Xbox, I want more old PC, and something I am planning on doing is putting some shelves up above those shelves that you see, like floating shelves on the wall, to display like some big box PC games. So I am going to be looking into those, trying to get back the ones I had as a kid, and maybe next year, next year's game room tour, you'll see all of that. But I think that pretty much wraps up this one. Again, I hope you enjoyed, I hope you liked seeing some of my games. I didn't show off most of the games. It was mostly about the consoles and the hookups and everything, but I hope this helped. I hope you had a good time. I definitely had a good time filming it, and yeah, guys, as always, I will see you in the next one. Hey, guys. My name is Rob Noir, and welcome to my game room video. So this is me doing another one of these kind of weird videos, something I've never really done. The Retron 77, the clone console recently released by Hyperkin. And so we're going to dive into what this thing is and what it can do in this video, kind of show you a comparison.